Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us to this uh, fabulous panel that we have assembled. Uh, we're going to talk about social media and the web 2.0 and its role in medicine. And this is part of a CME course that was hosted by the Cleveland Clinic on April 10th. Uh, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves. I myself am an associate professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, and I am director of education technology, and I dabble in social media. But the panel that uh, is assembled here has helped me learn more about social media than anyone else. So I'll ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, and we'll start left to right based on how they are on the uh, little photos that you can see at the bottom. So Anne-Marie Cunningham. Um. Okay, hello. I'm over here in Cardiff in the UK. I'm a family doctor and I also work uh, and I work for Cardiff University where I'm a clinical lecturer and I'm lead for e-learning there. And um, about five or six years ago I started blogging and tweeting and trying out lots of different things and I've learned an awful lot through it that I bring to all aspects of my work. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Catherine Kretchen? Hi, I'm Catherine Chrétien. I'm Associate Professor of Medicine at George Washington. I'm a hospitalist at the VA Hospital in D.C., and I also teach and direct medical students there. I started blogging in 2006 with a personal blog and then created a group blog called Mothers in Medicine that's still running in 2008. I do a lot of research in social media and, and use it frequently. Okay, thank you. And uh, Michelle Kraft. Hi, I'm Michelle Kraft. Um, I am the senior medical librarian at the Cleveland Clinic. I started blogging many years ago as a professional blogger uh, for librarians, specifically medical librarians. And I use social media to stay in touch with other medical librarians and libraries uh, and medical educators to understand how best to find information for doctors. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, Dr. Vinit Arora. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm Vinny Aurora. I'm here at the University of Chicago where I'm an associate professor and I also work in medical education in the dean's office um, directing scholarly concentrations programs as well as in the GME office integrating residents into quality and safety. Um, I'm passionate about using new media in my medical education which is what led me to join Twitter in 2008 uh, to explore it as a way to interact with students and residents from all over the world. And um, my Twitter handle is at Future Docs, and I've sort of built up a following on that and uh, I've done a lot of work on moderating med ed chats and a variety of research as well at social media. And then I, later, after a few years on Twitter, I got enough courage to start a blog, which I blog more occasionally. So. Great, thank you so much. So you kind of, each of you, told us briefly uh, why you got into social media and how you did it. But if, and you probably get this question a lot, uh, I do, someone who has not used Twitter or Google Plus or any of the social networks asks you, as a physician or as a medical professional, why should I even try to use this and we'll just take it in the same order maybe two or three quick points that you think would convince someone why they should dip their toes in this water so Anne Marie hi it's just you it's showing Michelle go ahead Anne Marie okay yeah it's okay it was just that Michelle was showing not me um, so I would say that the main thing is to try and decide what it, what it is that you actually want to connect with because social media is all about connection it's all about developing relationships and communities to me and so I think it's good to identify who are the people that you would like to be learning with and learning from and then figure out which are going to be the best tools to be able to allow you to connect with them so I think it's just about figuring that, if you figure that out and you can tell me what it is that you want to do, then I can probably try and help you figure out how to go about doing that. Okay, so I guess paraphrasing you're saying, depending on your need, there is a 
different reason to use social media for each person. And if you yes. talk to an expert, they can help you figure that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Uh, Catherine, how would you convince someone? What would be a couple things you would tell them to try? You know, I think one of the powerful aspects of social media is certainly the communities that you can build and the support you can get from a community. And so when I started Mothers in Medicine, I felt very alone as a junior faculty mother going through hijinks without having many friends who are in the same part of life and be able to share that. So being able to connect with others who are going through what I was going through was very powerful and helpful. So I would say finding and tapping into communities of people like you um, in terms of learning and supporting. And uh, as you talk about communities of people like you, are you, do you have a way to find these people? How do you go about, is this a daunting task of searching for a needle in a haystack? I think it can be a little bit overwhelming when you first start and maybe a good tip is just to latch on to a few people maybe that you know that have connections and seeing who they um, connect to and finding people through that and, and finding people through hashtags like MedEd community for those medical educators if you're interested in that. Terrific. So yeah, find someone that you think can help you, someone who has connections follow the people they follow, maybe look at their lists, and find, use some hashtags that are related to your specialty. Yes. Terrific, great points. Michelle, as a, your role in the library, you probably get to ask all kinds of questions. So what would be the questions you get asked about social media, and what do you tell them? Um, I get a lot of people who ask, why are you following people? Isn't it just, how much time does it take? Yeah. And for me, it's if it took a lot of time, it wouldn't be on my radar. Um, I think learning it can take a little bit of time, but learning it and integrating it into your workflow so it doesn't take any extra time is what is helpful for me. I, I have Twitter up, and it is in par a part of me just like email. And if you got rid of my Twitter account, I'd be just as lost as if I if you got rid of my email account. So it's, for me, it is actually no more time than, I mean, maybe if I had to add it all up, 30 minutes extra a day. But I could spend that 30 minutes extra a day reading more email or reading the newspaper or reading a journal article. And I get more out of it through the connections with other people out there doing the same thing. So you're saying that in some way, some of the information flow you divert from email to Twitter, and because you can select the people in Twitter, it may become more relevant than unsolicited emails? Um, well, I know. I mean, well, some of it's unsolicited, but I get a wide variety of different information that I would never have been emailed, that I find very helpful, that leads me into different ways of thinking. It also is um, tends to be more... Um, on the minute information, um, I can get answers pretty quickly. Whereas for some reason, email people don't answer as quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So there is a different culture of how to respond on Twitter, maybe. Okay, let's hold that thought because I think you also alluded to how you manage your time, and we'll circle back to that point. Mm -hmm. So, Winnie. Um, you work with students, colleagues in Chicago. What do they ask you, and how do you respond about social media? Um, well, I think uh, the two things that come up the most, um, which one of them Michelle mentioned, is how do you have time to do this? And I agree that a lot of it is um, about integrating it into your day. And it can be daunting at first. And so I also agree with um, Catherine, you know, it's good to start small. And I often say it's like a cocktail conversation, and you're just kind of you know, stepping into conversations, um, using hashtags to find out what you're interested in, but you shouldn't feel obligated like an email, like you, you need to read your email. You don't need to read your Twitter stream. You know, there are days that I don't check on Twitter. If it's something important, it will rise to the top because everybody will retweet it or somebody will, you know, if it's something that I really need to know about it because it was something published in my field, somebody will tag me and say, hey, have you seen this? Um, and so, so you have to have faith that um, the right information will come to you. And um, 
and it's also helpful to select your initial, the people that you're, um, you know, people often ask, how do you follow so many people? Um, and so I have, you know, like 2,000 people or something, maybe 3,000 that I follow. I'm not reading through their streams. Oftentimes I have a list of maybe 50 people that I have, like, rec like my recommended list that I've created for our medical education fellows. Many of you are on the list um, for people that I be believe are high yield, um, medical educators tweeting in that field. I have lists for other things like professional societies or journals. And so um, the, um, the utility of um, social media is really being able to uh, you know, call information and then prioritize it. And, um, and you don't need to feel like you have to check it every day. And so um, once I tell people that, they seem to feel a lot better uh, because usually it's the time and the obligation that they don't want to um, yeah. take on. No, great points. And actually, uh, one of the metaphors that I've used in the past is uh, for the same question. As I say, imagine you are in a camp in a desert, and there is this beautiful stream of fresh water flowing past you. And you'd say, I want to drink it all because I don't want to let any of it go unused. And really, you don't do that. You just, when you're thirsty, you take a cup and drink some. And if you get comfortable with that, I think it overcomes some of the anxiety because you have to balance information overload and we are trying not to have too much, but you're trying to filter it. And I think what I heard you say was you use the following the appropriate people and lists, creating lists to filter what you want to say. Right. Great. So the other theme I think uh, both Michelle and Winnie you alluded to was how do you manage your time? and. Uh, I would go out and say that I can post a tweet at any time in the day or night, and Anne-Marie will respond to that. <laughs> and, and there is a five and a half hour difference. So how do you do this, Anne-Marie? Do you drive people around you insane? How does this work for you? What's your day look like with social media? Um, it depends what I'm what I'm doing. I mean, obviously, if I'm in meetings or I'm seeing patients, I've got that kind of day going on. Then it can't involve very much social media. But if I was, and last night we were chatting when I was on the train, so I'm just like passing the time then on on a journey. So I'll be um, looking at more if I'm a passenger in a car and I'm well, my husband's listening to his music or something on the radio, then I'll be able to, so it kind of builds in that way. Or, but very often it's because there's some very particular activity going on, like a ch tweet chat, or being at a conference, or getting involved in a discussion. Or, I mean, sometimes if you, you know, you're writing a blog post or you're thinking about it, you're responding to comments, you're seeing what people say back. So it just depends on, on what's happening. But I've got pretty clear I mean, I think sometimes people are a little bit surprised when they meet me. They think that I must just be on my phone all the time, but I'm not really. It's just that I'm quite high, quite highly productive of tweets when I'm engaged. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I have to admit that uh, you bring a level of engagement to Twitter, which is very much appreciated. So thank you for being there. <laughs> uh, Catherine, Michelle, Winnie, uh, how does your day look like? or a week maybe if you don't use this every day. Maybe we'll start with you, Catherine. So, um, like what's been said before, I go through spurts of being able to check and being able to do that and be involved versus not. And so there might be a week or two where I'm completely not on Twitter and it's just I'm on service and other things are going on. So I just find it a treat when I can and I find out so much information and connect to people when that's available, but otherwise, I don't feel like I'm missing out too much no. when I'm not involved either. Yeah, yeah. That's Mich an important point. Yeah. Michelle, Winnie, I know you both talked about this, but do you want to uh, expand further on the nitty gritty of how you use social media in your day? Um, for me, uh, I don't see patients, so I'm a little I'm on my computer a little bit more than uh, somebody who's rounding or on patients. So for me, um, Twitter is often minimized on my screen, and similar to my email is minimized on my screen. So when I do get a tweet, it pops up a little box, and then I might glance at it, I might not. If I'm really engrossed in a search for somebody, if I have to do a systematic review or something, I am ignoring everything. 
and I will work on that. Um, not Twitter. I mean, work on the thing that I'm working on. Um, I also, um, I just, I try, uh, there will be days where I'm not tweeting at all. Weekends, I hardly ever tweet. Um, but I do try and connect with uh, the people who I have found uh, networked with often through tweet chats and schedule things like that where the one that I do is with a bunch of medical librarians and we do that every Thursday night and it's no pressure I probably do about two Thursdays a month and sometimes just because I really want to do that subject and other subjects don't interest me but it's a good way of just kind of staying fresh and keeping up with people okay great uh, anything to add to that Winnie um, you know, I kind of, uh, I would say, I, I, similar to everyone else, the only thing I can add is that, um, you know, when I look at the news feeds in the morning, I look for articles that, uh, you know, if I find an article interesting, I use that as my litmus test to post it on Twitter. Um, and so I tend to tweet, uh, you know, kind of in the morning, but it's kind of when I'm like, you know, getting up, getting ready, looking at stuff, um, seeing if there's anything interesting that happened overnight. And then, um, and then sort of throughout the day, um, it obviously depends on what you're doing. I agree when you're seeing patients, it's, you know, mm -hmm. using any form of technology when you're focusing on, you know, hearing about the story and, um, you know, integrating all of the stuff that you need to in an electronic health record is really difficult. Uh, but after I finish rounds, I might go on to Twitter and find out, well, you know, what's going on or, um, and so it's kind of, I actually find it as a fun stress reliever way. Um, it's not email. It's something that it's like something I want to do and it means I have a little bit of time in my day uh, to take time for myself and learn. And so when I'm checking the a hashtag of interest to me, um, it's usually like I'm learning something. And oftentimes I find an interesting article or about a new initiative or meet somebody that I can then kind of, uh, you know, either advance a topic on or refer to a colleague. And so um, I, I view that those are all positives that actually help me get burned out, avoid burnout, because it's not, it's not um, extra pressure that I need to do. It's more an uh, indication that I'm actually reaching out to others who are in our community and um, trying to advance our work together. Great. So. Uh, I think the theme here, if I'm sensing it right, is one, it helps you build connections, it helps you stay up to date, and that it's something you choose to do so you can filter what's coming to you as opposed to email, which often, at least half of it, is not what you decided. And it's you going out to find information or having it come to you as opposed to being thrown at you. So. Uh, we have a group of physicians watching this live and the question that they would have is what is my risk for uh, doing this? Are there any particular risks I should be careful of? What Can this hurt me? And uh, let's just go around the table and uh, think about this from different perspectives because we have uh, Anne-Marie from Wales and I know the uh, since the sentiment there tends to be a little bit different. So why don't you start and tell us about what the policies are there about using social media for physicians. I don't know, this is interesting that you you, you phrase it as being a little bit different here. Um, I, I think sometimes that people that look in see that there are more doctors engaging with patients within social media, within discussions in the UK than there are in, in the US. I'm not sure if that's 100% true. But there are there are discussions going on where there's not it's not necessarily your patients, but there are discussions going backwards and forwards around issues, which I think is entirely and appropriately a good thing. Um, so I'm not sure that's what you mean by the different attitude, but um, so what would be the I, risk? I, yeah. What? What yeah, the risks. Risk? What, yeah. what the risks? The risks are that you're not careful about what you do or what you say, and that you say something that is inappropriate to a much larger audience than you actually intended to. At the same time, you have to say, well, you know, everybody makes a mistake sometimes, and although we say this is always going to be permanent forever and it'll never go away, actually, it isn't going to be have that much news value for very long. <laughs> so unless it's absolutely atrocious and you should be feeling awful about it, and, you know, 
it's reflective of much something much wider. And then, in general, people can make a mistake and be able to get get past it as well. So I think that it's really bad if people get paralysed by thinking, "I don't trust myself." And if you're, you know, you're a competent person, you will know what's appropriate to say. Um, and and if you don't feel that, and you've any doubt about that, then feel free to sort of to stay away. But don't don't feel too paralysed by it. I think that in some ways we overestimate the risks. That's a great. Is that point. what you meant by what I would say? Is that what you meant? <laughs> uh, knowing you, yes, I knew that's what you would say. Now, <laughs> Catherine has written and published about the yeah. uh, issues of professionalism in some of our mainstream uh, journals. Uh, so, Catherine, what do you think the opinion or the sentiment in the U.S. is different? compared to maybe the UK, if you can comment on that, and do the state medical boards have a different view of what physicians do in social media? No, I'm not really sure I'm poised to compare our what we think versus the UK. I, I, I don't know that, but I think one clear risk is patient privacy, and probably the most yeah. serious one that we talk about. And so I think a lot of people who are on social media, physicians, have decided maybe for themselves that I'm not going to post about an individual patient in, in any kind of detail. And I know I personally follow that. So if I ever have this idea that maybe I want to say something about a patient, I just think about that. Do you really need to? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. So I think that is a clear risk. I agree that sometimes people are held back by the fear of making a mistake or the risks, as Anne-Marie said, but I think that we've all had so much awareness about this mm -hmm. and know now how to manage this professionally and responsibly that we can go forward and you know, experiment and see what we can do to, to help patients and to help um, our careers or uh, help just society in general by using social media. So can you expand on that? So I think this gets into the nitty-gritty of those who use social media would want to say, and I kind of am in that camp, that it has a huge potential to improve at least the quality of information that patients can find on the internet from more credible sources. Is that, is, are there other benefits? Uh, what do you tell your students? Uh, uh, they're going to be the future professionals. So I tell my students, yes, you are the future. Um, you are going to come up with wonderful ways to use social media and you know change the face of medicine. And so I want them to feel comfortable um, about how they are going to have their professional online identity, about how they're going to embody those values and ideals that they, that they carry anyway onto the online space, and then take that and be able to really innovate and go places that we haven't even thought of yet. So kind of go forward, but go forward cautiously. You know, think right. before you post, be thoughtful, and mm -hmm. try to make a difference. Okay. Um, Michelle, any comments on risks that you feel, not necessarily for physicians, but uh, from the point of view of all, all the people you interact with in the healthcare space? Well, I would say... You don't want to post anything that you don't want your grandma to read. <laughs> if your grandma can't read it, then maybe you shouldn't post it. Now, some people have more liberal grandmothers than others, but it's kind of a, that's kind of your, that's my, kind of my barometer. Um, and just like doctors who don't post about patients or specific patients, um, I do a lot of research for doctors and I don't really, I, we take that confidentiality also too. So I really don't write specifically about any doctors or nurses or anybody I'm doing research for. So it, there's also a little bit of confidentiality when you're doing just stop looking for information for people in general. Um, one of the things I also like to tell people is you can't be a robot. Um, some of my personality does come out on my tweets, and sometimes I do, you know, say, "Oh, it's, you know, it's absolutely freezing here," or something like that. And I think sometimes, if you let a little bit of your personality show, that helps people understand where you're coming from and get to follow you a little bit more. Yeah, excellent, Winnie. Any comments? And uh, I know you have a handle which says "Future Docs," so. 
maybe tell us how that started and because clearly that seems to imply medical students and then how would you tell medical students about the risk? I know you, there have been incidents we don't want to get into but we are all aware of that we have been exposed to and uh, what, uh, go on. Yeah, so, uh, you know, just like everything, you know, when I started on Twitter, I wasn't sure where it was going, and, you know, I, I, I kind of kept it pretty separate from my professional sphere. It was like an experiment. Um, and um, so I, I used my name, but I felt like I joined Twitter a very early time when people were not using their name on, on Twitter. I saw a lot more, you know, fun Twitter handles. So then I was like, well, what should my Twitter handle be? So for a long time, I lurked under a Twitter account that has my name, just my name in it. And then finally, you know, I was like, oh, maybe I should tweet about medical education. And, you know, I looked around for some Twitter handles, and this one was not taken. So I decided to choose that. Um, and it gave me a little bit of focus, because otherwise it can be overwhelming to be like, what are you going to tweet about? Having said that, you know, years go by, and you don't know where how things are going to end up or what programs are going to exist in the future. And so um, now I, you know, before I would never tell anybody I was on Twitter at my workplace because they would be like, why are you doing that, you know? And now people are like, oh, can you help me? And, you know, I put it in my e-signature. So we've evolved. And, you know, even in medical education, which is not necessarily the most, um, you know, you know, bastion of innovation always. Uh, even even people there are evolving, and you see a lot of medical schools and uh, residency programs on Twitter. So I mentor our chief residents. Uh, they run a t group Twitter account to try to promote uh, recruitment and recognition. Usually, use Twitter for the positive. Um, in terms of professional lapses, I think that it especially common when you're new to Twitter. I think that when you know, for, for an experienced person, I think they get a handle of. There's a lot of self-policing that goes on Twitter, and you know, even a, a minor comment made by a celebrity is going to get self-policed, and so you see that, um, and so you sort of start to think, well, you know, I pause a lot before, um, you know, if I have a tweet that I want to say, I always think, is this something I would feel comfortable shouting out into the street, and you know, people are okay with this, um, and sometimes the answer is no, or I might soften the language that I would use to describe it. Um, and for students, um, I think sometimes the, that's the hardest thing because they go from Facebook having more of a closed network of friends who they trust, who are their peers, to Twitter, which is much more public. I mean, they can keep a locked account, and some of them do, uh, but they still haven't adopted the professional identity of being a physician or having um, cared for a patient, and so having like a patient Google them. So I think they feel a little bit further removed from that, and that's where you start to see maybe some of the students can get into trouble. Um, but um, I know that there's a lot of efforts to teach um, students and policy statements. Many of the people on this call have developed uh, some of those cases, and I would say, you know, in some of those instances, a lot of it, it boils down to using good judgment because it's the same person who would tweet something that would be offensive. If they say that in class or uh, you know shout it in the middle of the street, you know that's still going to um, bring back some backlash. And um, and usually what is happening is it's not necessarily the case that a good student just got into trouble on Twitter. It's somebody who has a difficulty with finding that right boundary and the earlier we can identify them and kind of highlight that you know this is a, um, a need for you to protect your uh, professional image um, the better and um, and so I feel like it's sort of like a stress test in some cases for our students uh, but by and large I think most uh, you know we hear about the egregious cases but if you think about them in a you know the sea of all things going on on Twitter you'll see that most people are using it for uh, to be very positive and to promote a positive image. Oh, great. Can I just say something? Yeah, please, Anne-Marie, go ahead. So it, it, one of the things I think that does come up, I'm not going to like pick over these words, but this idea of protecting your professional image, that actually the important thing is your image, um, I think that's that's one of the things that uh, we have to be aware that we are actually proje we are projecting 
an image when we're doing this. So if somebody comes back over and looks at this again, they might think, oh, Anne-Marie Cunningham's a lot more liberal about this than I thought she was because whatever I say will be kind of immortalized in, in this way. But it's, it's not just about it. The, the two things. Our regulator, um, the General Medical Council, published guidance on social media last year. And the two things they say are really important, as just as, as Catherine has said, do not break, breach comp patient confidentiality. And as Michelle alluded to, don't bully or be nasty or anything about any of your colleagues and the people you work with. So if you're looking after people, other people, if you're really concerned about the patients and the people that you work with and other people you have dealings with, you're not really likely to do anything that wrong. All the other issues around your image and what it might be and you know how you might be as a doctor or, or in your different parts of your life and whatever, they're all very personal choices and people are going to have different um, and a day way different ideas about it. It's not so much that it's just your image, it's actually what you do. I think that's that's important. But I don't and I think that we, we focus a lot on the image bit and our students are actually very starting to get worried that everything will be tracked about them, that we'll hear things, that we'll flag these things up as being professionalism issues. I even had students say last week that they were worried because we were doing a project talking to some of our, our students here who are younger than students in the US um, to be fair and they were saying that they were worried um, that if they were seen kind of having banter or discussing about maybe oh I haven't got this done yet I'm not there I'm you know gonna be late for this session or whatever that this would be seen as being unprofessional by their tutors um, whenever you know all of us have times like this we're all human and um, it's not that you, you know we talk but 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 it's, it's just I, I just sometimes worry that we focus a little bit too much on this and, and make and make the students really really anxious so uh, along those lines, I mean, mm. uh, one of the problems I see, and my biases will start showing. Uh, <laughs> so the administrations, the state boards, I wonder how many of the people who are monitoring the physicians have actually been active in social media. And so, you know, if you have a judicial system where you're judged by your peers, is this... Uh, reasonable to be so if I made a mistake quote and it was the four of you who looked at it and said yeah Neil's a good guy he probably slipped up because of this and this and it's really not intended I yeah. think you could see it differently compared to someone who has not used social media so what should we do to get is this going to evolve over time or how do we uh, uh, enable it to evolve faster I think it will evolve over time. You mentioned state boards and that kind of stuff, but even our 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 uh, companies, you know, the you know our institutions, the hospitals we work at. Mm -hmm. I would venture to say that there are um, some people who are responsible for social media in hospitals who aren't as social media savvy as they should be for being in charge of such a uh, uh, an account, so to speak. And so I think. I think it's improving. I think it's always growing, and I think it'll get. Um, I think we'll see more acceptance of it. We've, we already are seeing more acceptance of it every day. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions from the live audience here, and the theme, at least from two of the questions, is: if you had to use social media in medical education, say you, I'm creating the hypothetical mm -hmm. case, but you have a group of residents or students and you want to say, next month I'm going to incorporate this in some way into my teaching because it seems like it's got the framework to improve uh, social constructivism or whichever theory you subscribe to. So how would they practically go around setting something up with their residents as a small step to experiment? Uh, anyone want to take that? So, can I? I'll, I'll just say something very quickly. I'm aware people. I'm an. I'm a kind of innovator, early adopter, prepared to try things out. Most people, most residents, most doctors, most students will not be prepared 
in a way to start trying out lots and lots and lots of things unless they very quite quickly see so some sort of benefit from that from that for them. That's why you get communities and things and email lists which never actually work and nobody uses them. So if you're going to do it, you're going to have to put a little bit of work into seeding that, keeping it going, encouraging, um, responding to people, letting them know that what they've said is, is useful. Um, you could start off with, I, I'm a big believer in the network, so I kind of think, well, if you're going to go to something like Twitter, then use it to help those uh, residents access your networks and other people's. So start a Twitter chat uh, or get them to join in with something that's already there so they actually see sort of the activity and explain it to them. If you want them just to be talking amongst themselves, you could use a Google Plus community and be thinking about identifying what are really the issues around what do you need to discuss, how can you protect patients with actually having that conversation within that space. Um, but it'll take a little bit of effort to keep that going and the best thing that you can do if you're somebody that wants to try this out is get a little bit of a feel for it yourself and see how much what you get out of it and then you'll be able to to be able to choose the platforms and help support them. Okay. Um, anyone else? Any ideas on how you would start using social media in education? I, I was asked this uh, question many years ago um, actually in a, in, a, in a panel I did with Kathy actually at a conference um, about how I would use Twitter with, um, with the students and residents that I know that are local. And at the time the penetration of an adoption of these types of technologies was really low and so it, I often would say you know it's going to be a very huge um, yeah. you, know, you have to surmount a huge activation energy to get people to adopt mm -hmm. and if you're already interacting with them face to face and they're taking your course mm -hmm. you know then there's other ways to interact that are positive <laughs> and let the early adopters kind of come to you and so one of the I started seeing this because I've been doing this for a long time and now I have students and residents before they even arrive here they have found me and they're like I'm excited to meet you Dr. Rora I'm coming and then you know that's kind of a, a nice uh, cue. This year things have changed a little bit and we did pilot in our residency program uh, running a Twitter account for the residency um, and I agree with Anne Marie it's like you need to really populate it and mm -hmm. feed it and so as opposed to having it be one person because remember like mm -hmm. I you know like you know any one person to do this that's like a job we have four people that basically group tweet to the chief residence account med chiefs and um, and then we set some parameters like what would they tweet about so uh, we were building a new hospital and we were gonna have some away rotations and so we thought well we'll treat our conferences the high yield pearls so that even if you can't go to conference you can get those pearls uh, we'll tweet mm -hmm. about recognition we'll tweet tweet about what's gonna be um, the lunch that day so people will be excited about coming to lunch and that during recruitment we made flyers with uh, QR codes to let people know that we're coming to the program follow us on Twitter follow us on Facebook um, we want to interact with you and so we really kind of had a co concerted social media strategy uh, around what our goal was um, and so that's a very different type of feel um, with a team approach um, and trying mm -hmm. to monitor your benchmarks than, um, than like a one, one instructor trying to kind of you know get more people to join Twitter in class yeah. um, and so I think that um, that there are these um, you know the time is actually right to start um, trying some of these innovative things because you now have a lot more people that are using social media and maybe they've just never used it in this way so we've had a lot of residents join Twitter this year as a result of the fact that the we've started this um, account however we also say you don't need to join you you know it's linked to a Facebook account you're all on Facebook you can just friend us on Facebook and then even if you don't want to do that we embedded the Twitter feed into the web page, the home page of the chief residents. So even if you everyone goes to that home page and you can see the tweets there. And so um, so it's basically a way to keep people up to date, another channel to keep them informed. And it doesn't matter which way they're getting that information, whether it's an RSS feed off the Twitter or they're kind of engaging with us. Uh, but those are the types of things that we've tried. Also promoting education like quit you know a, a pearl, clinical pearl or question of the week does very well as well. So I, I was I'm more skeptical about this before, but I think after our experience this year, I would say it's definitely worth um, 
trying, but you need to be committed and have maybe a team approach to try to help launch something. Well, what, what, what you've been doing there is actually just showing the, all of those staff, those, those trainees, as we call them over here, that you really care about them, that you want to spend some time making lots of effort to, to keep them up to date, to know what's going on, and that's, that's you know, bound to be appreciated that you've actually done that. They're they're welcomed and things like that. So you're building a community, the community with internally more than actually bringing them out to a wider community. They might pick that up as a as a benefit. But there but there is to a certain. I mean, lots of young people, uh, young people. I'm not young anymore. Spend a lot of time and they feel quite burdened already. And um, I had some students that said to me that they felt some of them said, "Oh, maybe I'm missing out on Twitter because when I was at school." one of the teachers started and they would answer questions through Twitter but that student already felt they were spending a lot of time on WhatsApp they were having to limit their time on Facebook because the social things were so I would be wary of starting a new so asking them to engage in a new platform whenever they're already to a certain extent struggling with actually balancing and, and, and managing digital distraction. So I think that's that's just something to be aware of is maybe if you're doing it with a small group of people, ask them, you know, what do you want to get out of it and opt in rather than setting a task where you say, oh, you must do this and so much will be part of your assessment task or something like that. Um, so, yeah, play it by ear. Right. Great. Yeah, I, would, I would echo that definitely take some planning and to really think about what goals you want to achieve mm. and then a platform that fits that goal. And I actually had started a reflective writing blog for my medical students um, some years ago. And my goal was really to add reflection into the clerkship. And I thought this community of blogs with comments mm -hmm. and sharing would be good for that. I think I learned from that experience was that there is this amazing activation energy. And for people to actually sign up for an account yeah. um, with Blogger, which is what I had, was tremendous and was very hard hurdle to pass and so the logistics got to be something and something else to think about is access can they all access on um, these platforms can they is there a firewall at the institution mm. blocking this and then it's also informing needed parties to know that you're doing this on social media and what your plans are because I think that mm. Dean's office probably should know um, just in case they have any input or they disapprove or just to have permission and the blessings of everyone involved. Okay, great. So switching to clinical areas from medical education and we talked briefly about the risks but uh, audience members have asked me about specifically about patients trying to now that you have a public persona how easy is it to reach you communicate with you about clinical issues outside the normal channels and how do you respond and uh, has that happened to you? What are the liability risks of not responding even? Anybody else want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you spoke first Anne Marie. Okay, I spoke first. So, so I'm the person that's probably m made most tweets out of, I actually might have made as many I don't know how many, well, I've made a lot of tweets over the years. And if you Google my name, it's very easy to come across lots of m my presence online. And I work, I worked in the same practice for um, 12 years. So if, you know, all my patients, if they wanted to, could be finding me and connecting me that way. But I have not encouraged them to do this. I have not made a, you know, sort of said, oh, there, there's a card or something and, you know, follow my tweets because they're not orientated towards patients and more orientated towards people that I might work with in the university but I'm aware that they might see them and I, there's nothing inappropriate there I completely follow Catherine's rule that I never say anything about my clinical work even if I had a good day or a bad day or anything I just keep that, that um, um, to itself but I've never had a patient contact me through social media now it might be because I work in a more deprived area where there's less levels of engagement, but there still is very high levels of um, engagement in, uh, you know, even with the internet and whatever. So I, I don't know why, but I, I have not found it to be a burden. People are really quite aware of, um, much probably more aware than we think of what are, what's an appropriate way to contact you. And they, they don't seem to be breaching this, in, in my case at least. And there are, yeah, 
that's all I would okay. say. Any, anyone else? So, I, I've not had that issue either, and I no. think primarily because I am a hospitalist and do inpatient medicine, so it's not like I have a panel of patients who I see regularly. But I would say one of the liabilities would be when you're interacting with anybody as a physician on social media is to be careful you're not giving medical advice um, and you could be liable for that and giving advice to someone who has a question who is not your patient, um, just someone who is online can be a problem. So it's, it's saying very general advice and please go see your, your doctor for you know, specific advice but to be careful of that. So I have a question on that, and it's not just you, but anyone on the panel. There was this case on Facebook where a mom posted a picture of a kid with Kawasaki's disease, and it was been diagnosed as a strep throat, but the antibiotics were not working. And the first few days are critical to diagnose and treat this. So if one of you could see this, you'd recognize that this is potential Kawasaki's, but you don't have a professional relationship. Would you respond as you, and compare that to you're walking down the street and someone collapses, and do you respond? And how is this different, or is it? I think that's an interesting question, uh, particularly when you compare it to being a good Samaritan, you know, and. Uh, airplane emergency, whatever have you. Um, as a physician, you know, you your duty is to um, offer your expertise and respond. Um, I am not a pediatrician, so I'm not sure that I would have known it was <laughs> Kawasaki's disease. But let's say that I did know. Um, I also think a picture, you know, is not necessarily the whole story. You don't have the whole history, and so you might. Uh, I would still plug, try to encourage them. To um, and if they happen to me on Facebook and they're my friend, that that's the only way that I would yeah. see it. I would probably message them and say, "Hey, you know, I don't know if this was brought up. This is not formal medical advice, but I encourage you to go to the ER." You know, and that would be how I would handle it. Um, and that would be pretty much um, you know, as a physician, we're all faced with these questions from friends and family. You know, I, I have family in India, like, that often I'm weighing in on a case and I'm like, I, I don't have the record, I'm not there, I can't take the history. Um, but, you know, everything with, that's all, you know, uh, more of a, um, a caveat to say, you know, here are a few suggestions. Um, have you talked to your doctors about these suggestions? Uh, because there's no substitute for um, a formal evaluation by um, by a physician, especially if the child is very sick and they need to be, and the antibiotics are, weren't, aren't working. That seems like something you would want to let them know that they need to seek help for. Um, so I don't think that that would get you in trouble, per se. Um, but obviously, there are a lot of gray areas. Um, and um, you know, I agree with Catherine, you don't want to end up in the border of like giving medical advice, but at the same time, you want to encourage people to, it's like saying getting a flu shot. You know, I, I would say, oh, time to get your flu shot, please get your flu shot. Um, that's more of a public health message. And I would say for this, um, you know, child and mother, you're trying to plug them into their community and make sure they're accessing medical care correctly. Great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's some of these things are there's no good answers and I think over time the culture is going to decide uh, maybe at some point virtual reality and uh, real life are going to merge so on that note I'm going to give each of you maybe a minute it's we got about five minutes left so if you had to just tell the audience a few things in a minute or less about social media medicine um, what would you say? And uh, anyone can go first, whoever's ready. <laughs> Nobody's okay. I'm going to go first then. <laughs> so I would say that I would say that it is it's very much about learning and it's about connecting with communities and it's not about just trying to get 
tell people things all the time, although that can be useful. There might be things that you want people to know about if you've written something. Um, and also it's about asking questions. So um, people will know how to engage with you if you give them some prompts by maybe asking them a question, if that's what you want to do. Um, but the best thing is just to go out there and have a go and try it out. And then you'll get a feel for it. But because it's kind of quite hard to imagine what we're talking about, I guess, if you've not had much experience. So dip your toes in the water and then yep. make a judgment. OK. I think uh, one way you could dip your toes in the water, obviously start small. If you're reluctant to start to see how it can be used professionally, try something that is a passion of yours that might be a hobby mm -hmm. that you can follow. And that way you don't feel the pressure of keeping up to date all the time about it or really trying to integrate it into your workflow. If it's just a hobby, you come and go with it as the hobby. And that might be a way to slowly integrate it in, and then you might see how it can be used elsewhere. Great. Um, Catherine or Winnie? So in addition to those uh, great tips, I would say to maybe find a mentor or twinter, yeah. as we <laughs> say on Twitter. And my twinter was Vinny. <laughs> So I had no idea how Twitter worked, and I was pretty lost when I first got on. And I, she was one that I latched onto to figure out, like, well, what do you do with all that, and <laughs> and who are you following, and what am I supposed to do? And that was really helpful to have someone that could help guide me. Okay. Um, I my biggest uh, takeaway is it's okay to lurk and decide um, mm. on this. Uh, you know, kind of there's these pyramids of engagement in social media. And some people are just going to be spectators, and they might mm -hmm. never want to be a creator and post things and you know create uh, you know um, you know videos or uh, blogs, and that's okay. Um, and so you know if you're a spectator and you're just there to learn and watch, there's no nothing wrong with that, and you don't need to feel pressured to do anything. And mm -hmm. so um, so I would say it's curiosity here that really. Uh, kills the cat and drives it forward. And so I did, I lurked for a long time mm -hmm. and wondered about this and asked a lot of questions. I also had a Twitter mentor, um, and, um, and then it was through her that I kind of was like, you know, when I was sitting with her learning more about it, I was ready to take the plunge. And so, um, and that curiosity kind of kept dr uh, driving me forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are things like even participating in my first. Um, chat. Uh, it was a healthcare social media chat. It was before we had meta chats, and I was still like, "Is this something I want to do? I'm going to clutter my Twitter feed with all these chat chatting things." Um, and uh, you know, again, I lurked for on the chat for the first time, and then the next time I joined and thought, "Okay, let's see how this goes." So you really can um, just observe and um, you know, and then decide what what is the right level of participation for you. Great advice. So I'm just going to summarize these excellent points. Uh, so we said you don't need to necessarily start by being active. Maybe lurk and watch and then learn. Maybe start with something that is not your profession but your hobby. Find a mentor to help you. And then once you get in, remember it's not just about, it's about communication and engaging and asking questions and uh, just imagine yourself face to face in a group. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't just keep talking, right? So uh, think about social media also as a two way street or a many way street. So, on that note, I'm going to uh, end this broadcast. Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Hopefully, we can do this again sometime. Yeah. And thank you to the audience for the great questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.